Ms. Delosier, and these are your notes on protein folding and denaturation. So the first thing we need to talk about is protein structure and how that relates to protein function, um, because that's going to be mainly why we talk about protein folding. So this is super important. The structure of a protein dictates the function of a protein. The structure dictates dictates the function. Structure dictates function. So what does that mean? Here's what that means. If I have a protein that's job is to bind to uh, starch and to break down the bonds between the individual glucose molecules in the starch molecule, that protein is shaped so it fits into that space between those alpha glucose molecules and it can go ahead and catalyze, speed up that reaction to go ahead and break down that bond. Um, and if I have a, a different shaped protein, it's not going to fit in that space. And that's one of the reasons that we can't actually break down cellulose because that amylase enzyme doesn't fit into the shape where we've got those beta glucose molecules. So the structure of a protein dictates the function. And you're going to find the structure dictates function throughout biology all year long. So the 3D structure is unique, and if I change that structure, if I alter the structure, that's going to alter its functionality. So if I take and I change the shape of a hemoglobin molecule, that's going to make it um, unable to carry oxygen as well as the, the normal hemoglobin molecule. So. Uh, you can kind of think of this like a lock and a key. If I have my key and that's my protein and I change the shape of my key, is it going to open the lock? No, because it's specific to that lock, right? So there are four levels of structure that we talk about in proteins, and we're going to talk about each of these individually. The first level is the primary level, um, and the first level of protein structure is really easy. We've talked about it a bunch already. It's just the sequence of amino acids. So for example, my sequence could be methionine, alanine, serine, lysine, and that's it. I mean, it would be a lot longer because proteins are a lot bigger than four amino acids. But there's my example sequence, and that is determined by the DNA. So your DNA is transcribed and then translated, and that determines the order of the amino acids in a protein. Um, and those amino acids are going to line up in a linear strand, and they're, remember they're held together by covalent bonds. That peptide bond between the uh, amino group of one amino acid and the carboxyl group of the other amino acid, those are actually going to be covalent bonds. So that's my primary structure. My secondary structure is going to be local folding. Um, so I'm looking at really short sections of my protein, and you're gonna get hydrogen bonds that happen between the backbone atoms. So really you're gonna get hydrogen bonding between like um, the, the amino groups and the carboxyl groups because if you look, the molecule kind of becomes polar and then as it folds up, you're gonna get some sections that are gonna be positively charged and some sections that are negatively charged. So it's all gonna form a 3D structure um, and it's primarily gonna form this corkscrew shape, which we call an alpha helix. And then it's gonna form this uh, shape, which is uh, called a beta sheet. Uh, so think of it when you take a piece of paper and you fold it up to make a fan, that's a beta sheet. It's actually a beta pleated sheet, but sheet is fine. So the 3D structure, um, and that's your alpha helices and your beta pleated sheets, localized 3D structure, alpha helices, beta pleated sheets. So if I ask you for an example of secondary structure, alpha helix, beta pleated sheets, that's it. And that's all due to those hydrogen bonding. The tertiary structure is where I get my whole molecule, um, my whole protein structure. And it's going to be due to hydrophobic and philic interactions. Um, but these aren't going to be hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions between the central atoms of the amino acid. They're going to be between the R groups. So those R groups, remember I have polar and nonpolar R groups, and then I've got positively and negatively charged R groups. So I'm going to get hydrogen bonds forming. I'm going to get um, some ionic interactions between positively and negatively charged R groups. And then when you have those um, 
those amino acids that actually have an R group that contains sulfur, you can actually get what's called a disulfide bridge, where the sulfur atoms in your R groups actually will form bonds between them, and those kind of lock and anchor the 3D shape together. Really, all the tertiary shape is locked and held together by, by these different types of bonds. So it's my overall 3D structure, tertiary, third level, is the overall 3D structure, and it's the overall globular shape. So when I look at just a picture of the protein, what's that overall 3D shape? Um, that's my tertiary. My quaternary structure is my fourth level, and it happens when I have multiple polypeptides that are gonna go ahead and interact together through hydrophobic interactions. So those multiple polypeptides are gonna, gonna kind of group together um, to keep the hydrophobic parts on the inside so it's not exposed to the surrounding fluid that is high in water. And remember, that's, that's a polar molecule. So I wanna go ahead and have those nonpolar parts kind of touching of my polypeptides, the separate chains, and that's what makes a functional protein. And just as an example, hemoglobin is a protein that is made up of four different subunits. It has two beta subunits and two alpha subunits, and that's the hemoglobin's overall shape. Its super 3D structure is its quaternary structure. So that's really all you need to know about the protein structure. Now what we need to talk about is what happens when I denature a protein. So when I talk about denaturation, that's going to be um, when I change the shape of a protein. So that's um, something that we're going to talk about in class is like melting the protein or melting the protein space, but it's not always has to do with melting. But denaturation is anything that causes the bonds holding the 3D structure together to break. And those bonds can be your hydrogen bonds, the ionic bonds, the disulfide bonds, but anything that causes those bonds between the 3D structure, so anything in that, um, that secondary or tertiary structure, anything that breaks those bonds is gonna be denaturation. And obviously, the easiest example of this is temperature. If I heat a protein up high enough, it's gonna go ahead and cause the bonds, the hydrogen bonds, um, between the different sections of your polypeptide to break. The hydrogen bonds break and then that causes the protein to unfold some or fold up differently and so I've denatured my protein. Also pH will go ahead and do this, changes in pH and salinity because if I look at changes in pH or changes in salinity, I can greatly affect those interactions between my positive and negatively charged side groups, those positively and negatively charged R groups on my amino acids. And so this changes the secondary structure, which remember that's the alpha helices and, and beta pleated sheets, and the tertiary structure, the interactions between the R groups, it changes that structure. And therefore, it destroys the function of the, the original protein. That original protein can no longer do its job. And that's all, all it means when we talk about denaturation. Um, so I hope that's helpful and that you understand a little bit about the four levels of protein structure. If you have any questions, just come on and see me during class during block lunch. Or